teaching experience. I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then. Don't keep them. They're not pets. Don't go to pet go to buy little goodies for you, your sins. They're not pets. And turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Isn't that how you feel after we burn a sin list? You get refreshing. And that he may send the Messiah who is appointed for you, even Jesus. All right, now do you want the Messiah to come? Because see, Messiah's come and gone in this passage. At this stage, Jesus has been, he's gone back to heaven. And he's telling us, like he told them, that if you want Mashiach to come, now that he's already been, that we got to repent. Heaven must receive Jesus until the time comes for God to restore everything. Or restore all things. As he promised long ago through his holy prophets. So there's a restoring of all things which needs to occur and we're a part of that. When we started, we understood we're a part of an end time. Now back in the day, they used to say that Herbert Armstrong was the end time Elijah to come. Okay, Elijah restores all things. Mr. Armstrong made a great start. But he didn't restore all things. He restored a lot of things. He didn't get it all done. Even when it comes to Torah, he got the ball rolling. No one kept any of this stuff before he came along, and he took it a long way. But he didn't finish, even on the Torah observance. Amen? There was no redemption of the firstborn. We had the blessing of the little children. That was great. We did, but we didn't redeem the first. You see what I'm saying? We've added stuff that they couldn't have imagined needed adding. Hallelujah, we're part of that. We came out of Mr. Armstrong's work. There's a lot of reasons why I always affirm that. Because Mr. Armstrong started the end time Elisha work back in the 20s. We're a part of that work. We're a proud part of that work. And we're going to continue it on until, until it's over. Amen? Psalm 14, I'm going to take you to where this, there's two places where uh, he's quoting from. Psalm 14 and Psalm 53 where it says there's going to be a restoring of all things. Psalm 14 and verse 7. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord restores his people. There's a restoring coming for the people of God. And he says exactly the same thing in Psalm 53 and verse 6. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when God restores his people. Let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. So there's a restoring. We're supposed to rejoice at the restoring. The restoring of all things. There were a lot of things in the early church that we do not have a def definitive historical record of. Why? Because they hunted those people to extinction and burned all their stuff. So you have Bible record. Praise God Jesus kept it for us because the Catholic church would have destroyed this. And tried many times. If you don't believe me, go watch Lamp in the Dark. It shows how they tried to destroy the Bible. But God always had a remnant somewhere that preserved what you have. So you have this record, and then there's a gap until about 200 and something A.D. And at 200 and something A.D., you have Catholic history of what happened in the inter intermission. Not our history. Our history is gone. Because they burned everything. So you have to extrapolate from clues. So when they tell you the heretics kept Sabbath, oh, that's our people. Yes, they kept Sabbath, yeah. That's not heretics. Those are the true people of God. So you've got to discern the clues from the text that you already have from the history of our adversaries. Yeah, that's how you have to do it. It's not pretty. I was thinking about some of that on drive up here. So Yeshua and Avi have been very active at Hungry Hearts by giving us new and amazing revelations in the Holy Bible. That used to be a good thing. With me, it's still a good thing. I mean, there's nothing like getting a great revelation in the Bible and following it out. I mean, we're going to get into Babylon at the very end here. Um, but I'm just going to tell you the day that he opened up the revelation of Babylon, I had four Bibles out and both concordances. I spent all day in the Word. It was amazing, opening up phrase to phrase to phrase. Just like Mr. Armstrong said, line upon line, here a little, there a little, using the Bible to unlock the Bible. You know, looking up words, finding out the real meaning, finding out other places that real meaning was used. 
Ooh, that was some good stuff. Matthew 17, we're going to talk about Elijah. The work of the prophet Elijah. <clears throat> now, back in 02 and 03, when we got started, a lot of people were talking about being a part of the end time Elijah. Well, if you're going to be a part of the end time work of Elijah, or should I say the work of the end time Elijah, you've got to do the things listed for the end time Elijah, right? <laughs> you can't just... Well, I like that one, but that one's too hard. Let me tell you, you go back and you look at Elijah in the Old Testament, you look at John the Baptist in the New Testament, this was not no candy, candy cane ministry here. This was, this was some heavyweight stuff. He didn't miss any words. <clears throat> so I, I think it was the Pentecost message, the Lord said to me, okay, so is John the Baptist the type of the Elijah who was, or is the Elijah who was a type of the John the Baptist who came? Now, I, I endearingly call him Crazy John because that's the way they portray him in The Chosen. But I don't think that he was crazy. I think he was a serious son, a son of a priest. I mean, come on now. I mean, this guy was raised up to be a priest. Perry Stone relates the Jewish legend that he was given the girdle of Elijah the prophet that was kept in the temple. Now, that's just legend. But see, when John the Baptist shows up, he's dressed like Elijah. That's why they ask him, are you the Elijah? He's dressed like Elijah. He's talking like Elijah. He's acting like Elijah. So they're asking, are you Elijah? They know the prophecies. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty heavy. Sorry. Right. So uh, verse um, 11. To be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. Elijah's going to restore all things. So the Elijah work has to restore all things. Now look, Jewish legend has it that Elijah's going to show up on Passover in Jerusalem to prepare the Jews for the Mashiach. According to my studies, that happens right after the rescue. So let me ask you, is the restoring of all things to Judaism that happens after the rescue, is that just for the Jews? Is it not also for us before he comes? Right. Well, if it's going to happen before he comes, it's not going to be him who personally does it. It's going to be those people in the end time Elijah work who does it in the church so we make the rescue so he can come and restore the Jews. Come on. That makes more sense, doesn't it? Yes, it does. All right. He says exactly the same thing in Mark chapter 9 and verse 12. So we're a part of this end time Elijah work in Yeshua's church and the restoring has been going on with us for some time. Flip back over here to Malachi 4 and verse 5. <clears throat> so we just read where Jesus affirms this verse, right? See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. There's a Rav Tov. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Rav Tov, the end time. He's going to send Elijah before that. Jesus just affirmed it. To be sure, Elijah comes to restore all things. He will turn the hearts of the parents to the children. It's a horrible translation. The fathers. Turn the children to the fathers. This is important because it's not parents though that application can be made on a Darash right now level. Mr. Armstrong correctly saw this as turning us, the children, back to the fathers, Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's to return us to the fathers. Mr. Armstrong saw this clearly. That's what made him the beginning of the end time Elisha work. The forerunner. This led the church of God to return to Torah. Though he backed off some. Like, for instance, they, they, they talked about the dietary laws. We're going to keep the dietary laws. But he said those were physical laws. But Torah says they're spiritual laws. And so does Peter. He says they're spiritual laws. So at some point, you know, and I understand. I'm, I'm not demeaning Mr. Armstrong. He ran into a lot of opposition from all. you got to remember what life was like in the 20s and the 30s. Grace, grace, grace. Greasy grace. Grace, grace, grace. Even Billy Armstrong said, oh, yes, you're the, you're the uh, evangelist of law, and I'm the evangelist of grace. I'm sorry, Billy Graham. So, I mean, the thing is that he faced a lot of opposition doing what he did, and he carried it a long way, and we're grateful. 
We're grateful. He's the forerunner, and he deserves the credit for everything he did. We are, on the other hand, are living in a different time where it's a little more free, actually, for us to do these things. And since people already think we're crazy, we don't have to worry about the grace, grace, grace stuff because they're they not going to associate with us anyway. So we can just go ahead and do everything that it says and not worry about it anymore. So we got to go a little further with Torah than everybody else did. And I remember in, um, in Worldwide, I used to study paul's letters and compare and contrast them with the torah and they said oh you're in an old testament too much and i'm like i don't see how paul's talking about old testament how can i not look the verses up he's quoting all these verses what i'm just supposed to just take it like he pulled it out of thin air no you go back and you study you learn the torah contrasting living by the law with the need for forgiveness from jesus yeah these things are not incompatible actually this is sesame street these things go together these things go together all right, <clears throat> go to Matthew 3, go to Matthew 3, and we're going to talk about John the Baptist. So when I say crazy John, I'm saying that because they call us crazy too, amen? All right, Matthew 3 and verse 1. In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Okay, so he's telling people to repent. He's not telling them, okay, it's all, it's all great. It's all great. Grace is good. And saying, this is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair. Thank you, Jesus. I get to wear real clothes. And he had a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem in all Judea and the whole region around the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. So they had to actually say it. You're ever so grateful we burn sin list. John made them give it up. In front of everybody. But when he saw the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming where he's baptizing, he said, oh, great, we have partners in ministry. Not exactly. So, my youngest grandson calls them nakes. And Mimi had him rolling out Play-Doh to make nakes. So, nakes are a big deal with my youngest grandson. So, they come up and he's like, nakes! I'm not Hey, you brood of vipers! You're a bunch of snakes! Who warns you to flee the coming wrath? Jesus got his whole out. He's going to cut your head off. Well, I'm paraphrasing, but it's not much different because at the bottom of this verse, he says, the axe is laid at the root of your tree. All right? Produce fruit with keeping with repentance. So it's not enough to say, I committed these sins, I'm sorry. You got to come back down to the Jordan and show John how you're different. How is she going to produce fruit? You can't produce fruit at the moment of repentance. You got to go out and produce fruit after repentance and bring it back. Oh, and don't think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you, out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax is at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit is going to be cut down and thrown into Gehenna, the lake of fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who's more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he's going to clear the threshing floor, putting the grain in the barn, and the chaff he's going to burn up in Gehenna. This is not easy preaching. This is not, this is not make me feel good. Oh, pastor, I came to get my blessing. Oh, came to the wrong pastor. Not, not exactly how to win friends and influence people. Not smooth words. Repent, return to Torah, shun evil. The Lord's coming. You better be ready. Let me show you why. Malachi 3. Easy flipping. It's not that far. So, Mr. Armstrong used to preach like that. People loved it. Preach like that now today. People say, oh, that's terrible, Pastor. You're so mean. Who's mean? The man that's going to let you go into tribulation? Or the man who's trying to stop you? While you're dead set, you're going to do it. All right, Malachi 3, verse 1. Now, I got a revelation preaching this in court. <laughs> I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. We just quoted that. Mm -hmm. Then suddenly the Lord you're seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. Did that not happen right after John? Jesus showed up at the temple. Uh. 
But who can stand the day of his coming? For he's going to be like a refiner's fire or fuller's soap. That means bleach. You ever get it on you? Burns, tear your skin up. He's going to bleach you. He's going to bleach bit your head. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Okay, so the teachers of the law, he's going to be even more stringent, wasn't he? Because we're going to read where he said the same thing about the Pharisees, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee to come and wrath. But here's the revelation I got in Corinth. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. See, we didn't know about offerings. We didn't know about offerings. We used to pick up offerings, silence. Silence. Pass the bucket in silence. We didn't know. That's what we did back in the day. We didn't know. New revelation in hungry hearts. So I'm going to come. I will come to put you to the test. I will come to put you on trial. That's what Jesus is saying. I'm going to come and put you on trial. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, perjurers, against those who defraud labors of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless and de deprive the foreigners among you of justice. But do not fear me. The beginning of wisdom is the fear, fear of the Lord. Amen, right? So he's coming to test. He's not coming to play nice. He's coming to bring justice, and that requires punishment. People don't want a Jesus who punishes. Oh, that's hard, Pastor. Don't tell me about that. Jesus loves me. Yes, he loves you. And he's going to take you behind the woodshed and take the belt off and tear you about up. And we've lost that love in modern society. Oh, no consequence for sin. Oh, there's consequence? All right. You, you better hope he tears you up on this side of the tribulation so that you can repent before the tribulation gets here. People worry about all kind of silly stuff, man. You need to make sure your life is good because when the tribulation comes, it's going to be too late. It's going to be too late. You just in. Luke chapter 3 doesn't say it any different. Actually, Luke gives a little fuller account, and it's even more stringent. Not less stringent, more stringent. Luke 3. <clears throat> in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip Tetrarch of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysan... Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Ananias and Caiaphas, the word of the Lord came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. So the word of the Lord comes to the son of a priest in the wilderness, and he goes into all the country around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the, of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Not smooth words. Every valley should be filled in. Oh, we don't mind the valleys filled in. And every mountain and hill made low. Yeah, we mind that. We mind our mountains and hills being ground off. The crooked roads shall be made straight. How you do that? With a bulldozer. Not fun. The rough way is smooth and all the people will see God's salvation. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized him. So not just the Pharisees. He was the equal opportunity blaster. You brood of vipers who warn you to flee to come in wrath. He told everybody that. You are a snake, and you need to repent before Jesus cooks your rear end. Snakes. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and not, do not begin to say to yourselves, oh, we're descendants of Abraham. means nothing, because God can raise up stones. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into Gehenna fire. So what should we do then? So the crowd gets it. No one's over here going, oh, speak to me smooth things, Pastor. That's too hard. They're like, oh, what do I got to do? I don't want to die. What do I got to do? Because they understood Gana Fire. Because the Valley of Ben Hinnom is just outside of Jerusalem. They understood. Right? See, for us, I, we just got to be explained. But for them, they're living right there. <clears throat> he said, anyone with two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone with food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, right? The traitors and the trees and the treasonous people of the of the realm. What should we do? Don't collect any more than you're required to. See, you go to the HR block and you get a refund. So tax season is like a big deal, right? Back in the day, they had onerous taxes. 
The tax collector was to extract out of you everything he could get for Rome, but his living was based on how much he could take from you over and above what he gave to Rome. He got his fee from you. The problem is, a lot of them didn't take what they needed to have a decent living. They extorted the people. And they walked around with all the trappings of luxury and riches while the people were suffering. That's why they were hated so bad. So what does he do? Take only what you have to. We know you're getting your living from it. We all understand that you have to eat and have a house to live in and clothes to wear. We get all that. Don't, don't take any more than you're supposed to. Soldiers! Soldiers! What do we do? Be content with your wages and quit taking bribes. Why? See, we don't even think about America because it's not that common. We should send a lot of stuff to Joe's fat in Africa. Okay? So I told him one time, I said, bro, I said, I spent a lot of stuff for the stuff I mailed. I had to spend almost as much stuff in the postage to ship it to you in Kenya. I don't have the money to pay the bribe at your post office. That you've got to come up with. So I had to quit shipping him stuff because I couldn't afford to bribe on the other end. I spent $122 to send one little tiny box of stuff to him, and it came back because he couldn't pay the bribe. So we don't even think about that. But here John the Baptist is saying, don't take any bribes. Just take your pay and be happy. But hey, in, in, a, lot of, in a, lot of, a lot of the world, you want to get something done, you got to grease the palms. you got to grease the palms. Building inspector comes out, oh, I'm shutting your job down. Why? <laughs> you got to pay him the bribe. Everybody in a lot of these countries has got to be paid a bribe. We don't even think about it. Praise God. Hallelujah. We're happy. America's a great place. I don't know all the words, but God bless America. Now, the people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering if their hearts, if John might possibly be the Messiah. And John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit, and he's going to baptize you with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor. He's going to gather the wheat into the barn. He's going to burn up the chaff in Gehenna. And he exhorted the people. Now, we don't call that exhorting anymore. Exhorting is patting them up, making them feel good. Oh, you can make it. Yes, Jesus loves you. We call that an exhorter. Here, this guy is saying John is exhorting them by warning them to flee. Turn away from it while you got a chance. So do we or do we not live in a time where this is needed more than ever? So <clears throat> look at the news. Some of you told me you can't look at the news. It's too discouraging. It's too crazy. Look at the news and tell me that if we need this. I mean, I look at Fox News every day. We need this. Yes, we, do. we need this. This is in dire need all over the place. Amen. <clears throat> we need to thunder down the anger of a righteous God on a wicked nation who is going straight into depravity. We need to teach those who repent how to live Torah in a modern life. How does Torah apply in your life? Some of those obscure passages don't make any sense in this modern world. I mean, how many of you are going to grow a field of soybeans? Okay, nobody. But back in the day, they all grew a field of beans, and they were mixing the seed and then harvesting it, and then they would just grind the whole thing together and make their bread. God's saying, no, only one kind of seed in one field. Makes no sense to us because we don't have to do that. Your little vegetable garden is going to have a few plants of everything in there. It's not the same kind of operation. But what he's telling you is be pure. Don't mix. Be pure. Don't mix with the world. Be pure. Did he say the New Testament? Don't be polluted by the world. Stay pure. Because you see, that mixing, the whole idea of mixing is a bad deal. All right. So teaching people to live Torah in a modern life. Then we need to take those Torah observant people and teach them how to worship. You gotta teach them how to worship. You gotta teach them how to open their heart to God. Then we gotta take the Torah observant worshiper and teach them how to understand and use the Spirit of God. And it needs to go in this order. Now, I know people come in from all different backgrounds and all different stages. They did it hodgepodge. But I'm gonna tell you that everything we learn from, from the, the, the people who were spirit filled turned out to be wrong. They call it Pentecost. Among themselves, they call it Pentecost. They don't have to go through all the denominations of all the ones, they know who they are. They'll say, oh, and all of Pentecost, I've never heard of such a thing. 
okay, but everything they taught us about the Holy Spirit was wrong. How do we know it's wrong? Because we tried it and it didn't work. If it's right, it has to work, right? I mean, if you fix your car and it doesn't work, then you, you don't go, oh, I fixed it right. You know you fixed it wrong. Either the parts are wrong, you did the wrong procedure. Go, come on, guys, you put something together, you got a pile of parts left over. Well, I messed something up. <laughs> time to go back and read the instructions. After about the third time, you're going to take something apart for the third time. You learn to read them first. I know you're not supposed to, so we do it in secret. It's kind of like the man's code. I never read the instructions. You read them in secret, maybe three or four times, and then that way you can showboat in front of your wife. Oh, yeah, I didn't have to read the instructions. I'm a man. <laughs> Meanwhile, every man knows what I'm saying is correct. If you don't want to disassemble it three times, you read the instructions. Because <laughs> every time you put it together without them, you've got to take it back apart. But every time you got to take it back apart, something breaks. Y'all will catch that. The men, don't, men already got it. Acts chapter 15. It needs to go in that order because, you know, you got to get your flesh right in Torah before you can venture. You need to learn how to offer yourself to God in worship before you start playing in the Holy Spirit. There's an order to this, and we are ever so grateful that Yeshua brought us in the proper and correct order. We all had to learn how to be Torah observant in worldwide in its offshoots before we could learn how to worship, before we could learn how to work in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Acts 15, verse 15. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this. As it is written, after this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. What was David's fallen tent? He built a tent for the Ark of the Covenant. He said, I cannot put the Ark back in the back of that tabernacle where no one sees it except on the Day of Atonement, and I can't go in. He says, I'm going to build an open-air tent for the Ark of the Covenant because I've got to have my God near me. David has to get a right-now word from the God, and he doesn't want to go through 16 people to have it diluted down. He wants to hear it directly from God. So Moses got the revelation of worship hundreds of years before David got the revelation of, I'm sorry, Moses got the revelation of law and Torah. Then David got the revelation of worship. And years later, Elijah got the revelation of the school of the prophets, how to work in the Spirit. It goes in an order. And praise God, thank you, Jesus, he took us in that order. Why? Because he wants to do something here. He wanted it to be right here so we could do things with it. Oh, come on. It's ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord who does these things, things known from long ago. Among the churches of God, we were the first to go into praise and worship in a big way. Now many followed. They take it for granted. Kelly Mack goes to a feast site sometimes down on the Gulf Coast, and they do about 30, 40 minutes of praise and worship. When we started in 04, nobody did it. Nobody did it. People said, you're not going to do that praise and worship at that feast site, are you? Yeah. I don't know if we can go. No, see, y'all take it for granted, but that wasn't the way it was back in the day. How long? Yeah, how long? How, no, 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 no. How long is your song service? They refuse to call it worship. How long is your song service? <laughs> now, look, I'm going to tell you, y'all don't know this, but back in the day, I was a hymn man. I don't mean the ones y'all remember. I mean, I mean the Dwight Armstrong hymn man. Miss Sandy, tell you, I used to be a hymn man. And then, and then when we left, we left United, we, we, we went and we got the Mark Graham hymnal. Oh, yeah, I got the Mark Graham hymnal. That was a good hymnal. And one of the reasons we went, because it had CDs, right? Now, down in Tupelo, they were still using the worldwide hymns off of tapes, where you had to do three in a row, because they were on tapes. Man, we had moved. Y'all don't understand back in the day what a big move that was. We had CDs. We can do three of anything on that disc. Because we got CDs. Oh, man, y'all don't understand, man. This was a big deal. And I bought a bunch of them because I expected a lot of growth, and then I couldn't get rid of them because we didn't stay at hymns long. Shortly after the hymns, we went right on in to the first ones. My first worship disc was the Prayer of Jabez CD. Oh, but you don't understand that. That's listening music. That's we can't we can't use that in church. Oh my goodness. Not realizing my daughter was getting baptized in the Holy Ghost in her bedroom listening to Christian music. I didn't know that. I didn't find that out for years after it happened. 
So I'm, I'm playing this worship music while I'm setting up the hall, not realizing that's going to blow me out of the hall and out of that church. Why? We didn't do it at church. We're still using hymns. Oh, y'all don't get this. Man, the first time we did Passover dinner, we did a couple of hymns. Oh, my goodness. Dinner at Passover? Oh, Schultz is going crazy. He's off the rails up there because we had dinner at Passover. I'll never forget one of the people who was there. We went up to Mark Jefferson's house. They went, oh, this seems so right. Yeah, it seems so right. It's right there in the book. <laughs> dinner, dinner. Look, we only did one song at Passover. Y'all don't understand this. We did one hymn because it says they sang a hymn when they left Passover. And so we did one hymn, not even a piano on that hymn. Not even a piano on that hymn. We sang one hymn made from Psalm 51 and walked out of there with our head down. I'm not making this up. This is real deal stuff. So if you guys came into Hungry Hearts back in 2003, you wouldn't recognize the place. The travel menorah, the travel menorah. The one we bring to feast, travel menorah, right? We made it for the feast of 04. Oh, man, we had arrived. We got a menorah. You don't understand. We're using a little candelabra menorah from the temple. Man, when we came to the feast, we had a menorah. We were walking around there like we, we couldn't do no wrong. Man, we were like, we have a menorah. Y'all don't understand. Oh, oh. Now many followed. We went first. We took the heat. And to my memory, nobody ever called me up and said, hey, Schultz. I didn't mean to give you such a hard time over that worship, man. We're sorry. We all do it now. Nobody called up. No, nobody called up and said that. We started on stronger tour than anybody, and we kept it up. Oh, you mean you keep all those little rules? Yeah. No. Yeah. We're still out from when it comes to using the Holy Spirit. But individuals bubble up because they get that spontaneous. They, they get to praying, and they get to doing stuff, and next thing they know, they're, they're speaking in tongues, and then after a while they realize, hey, I'm, I'm speaking in another language. But they can't talk about it in the churches they're in, in the Sabbath world, because that ain't allowed. The Hebrew roots, right? The Hebrew roots. People, people use a few of them here and there so they feel comfortable with it, but, man, for us to do the Talit and the shofar and the menorah and say a Hebrew blessing when we did it. Schultz has lost his mind. <laughs> what comes back? It came back around. Schultz has lost his mind. I can't believe they're doing that up there in Jackson. They have lost their mind. Now a lot of people do it. But when we started, it was brand spanking new. Then Yeshua gave me a big push. Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. Acts chapter 2. Just do it. You know it's right. I told you it's right. It's in my word it's right. Just quit dragging your feet. Everybody thinks I'm quick. I was called impetuous a lot of times. I'm not really impetuous. I, I mull on this stuff forever. The Lord tells me almost every day, you have the slows. Get moving. Acts chapter 2 and verse 17. The last days God said, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men, your who? Sons and daughters. Oh, my goodness. That's still causing a stink. You ordain women? Your, old, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will, on who? On both men and women. So after, after service, I'm talking to Barbara, and she said that she came across the name Tabitha, and she drilled down and did a little study on that, and it turns out that Tabitha was an apostle. So I asked her to get me that reference so I can know it. So Junius was an apostle, but it turns out it's Junia in the Greek. It's not the male, it's the female. So Juni is an apostle. Now Barbara's telling me Tabitha was an apostle. Oh, just getting better and better. But see, that's what happens when you go first. You keep getting more revelation. See, it, back in the day, we used to get a revelation. It would be what we called temple talk. And it would be restricted to some of us 
let's say, more outlandish brethren in the church, and we would have temple talk, and we would talk about these things, but don't talk about it in front of the minister. We get put out. That's what passed for conspiracy theories back in the day. I wish I was making this up. I'm not making this up. This is real deal stuff. And so that's where it would stay. That's where it would stay. You weren't allowed to get understanding. You weren't allowed to get a revelation. You weren't allowed to go forward. It was fossilized. I remember a couple came to Perry Stones one time. They were passing this book around fossilized religion. And they gave me one, but I never went with it because they kind of yeah, gave me the heebie-jeebies. But I thought to myself, you know, we could be fossilized too because we too often don't want to take the new revelation. We too often just want to sit and be content. But that's the whole point of fossilized religion, right? It gets fixed. It gets fixed. Yeshua keeps growing. <clears throat> so he's going to pour out his spirit. Men and women are going to prophecy. Elijah, the end time Elijah work comes to restore the school of the prophets. So men and women are going to prophecy. Men and women are going to prophecy. He said it twice in this and there's Patsy Adams down in Somerville who opened up to this idea in that period between churches. Opened us up to that. Never forget, well, you've heard us talk about the day. So uh, we got to make sure we remember Pat Robertson. I forgot that last night because we got the idea of burning sinless from Pat Robertson. We acknowledge him. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I did him last. Did we do him last night? I don't remember. All right. So... <clears throat> After 9-11, he came up with this idea to do, a, to do fasting and prayer for 50 days from trumpets, the day of judgment, to Thanksgiving, our national day of Thanksgiving and praise. So it's not really Turkey Day. It's the day when all of us are supposed to go to our Creator and acknowledge the great blessings we have in America. The dinner's just supposed to be a part of that, but now it's just kind of devolved into Turkey Day. So I thought, that's, that's good. So me, Lanice, and, and Miss Sandy, we all agreed that we were going to jump in on this 50 days of fasting and prayer. But from that, he gave, brought the book out, Steps to Revival, from which we got Burning the Sin List. So the first time we actually burned sin list together down in Somerville, we had that great encounter that we've described to you so many times where Miss Sandy got slain in the spirit, and we didn't know what it is. So I'm over there, do I need to call EMS? Do I need to call Matt? She's like, she's fine, leave her alone. No, really, do I need to? I'm sitting there, man, I got Miss Sandy laying on the floor. She can't get up. I bet I, I feel responsible. Do we need to call EMS? I can't let something happen to Miss Sandy, right? No, no, she's fine. She's fine. My daughter's praying in tongues. I didn't even know my daughter prayed in tongues. In the car going home, I found out she got it spontaneously in her room, listened to Christian worship music, but I didn't know that then. All I know is that stuff is happening, Patsy's praying in tongues, Sandy's on the floor, a voice behind me said, get on the floor, I'm on the floor repenting for everything that I've ever done and everything anybody's ever done to me. I think God's fixing to show up in the room and I'm going to die. Man, it was crazy up here. We are missing three hours where we were in the presence of God and we can't account for those three hours. They're just gone. We started at nine, it's, 7.30, 9 o'clock, something like that. And next thing we know, it's 2.30 in the morning. At least kept saying it's 9, right? Something's wrong with my eyes. It's 9, right? No, honey, it's 2.30. No, it can't be 2.30. It was at nighttime. It's got big skylights, right? So you see these lights right here? There was like eight of eight spaces like that in the middle of the room that was a giant skylight. It was daylight bright in there. Well, I got news for you. It ain't daylight bright nowhere at 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> yeah, there are no windows in that room, right? I mean, it was dark. So we got introduced to the school of the prophets. Part of the end time Elijah work. Something that's supposed to take care, be taken care of. Something that's supposed to be restored. <clears throat> it's sorely lacking today, but it was a part of the early church. Acts chapter 21. This was a part of the early church. This was not foreign to them. If you walked into a first century church, there would be prophets, and they would eat your lunch and read your mail, and, and it would be expected that you would just go ahead and receive it. Amen? <clears throat> Acts 21, verse 8. <clears throat> Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house where Philip the evangelist, one of the seven. So here's a man who was one of the seven original deacons. He's now an evangelist. Kind of saw it coming, right? 
<clears throat> he had four unmarried daughters who were prophetesses. Women, prophetesses. Young women, because they're not married yet. So this is in the early church. Look at the next verse. After we'd been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet, said the Holy Spirit says, in this way the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and hand him over to the Gentiles. Not exactly what Paul wanted to hear for the day. <laughs> Nothing smooth there. Yeah. I mean, a real old school, hard time prophet in the church. <clears throat> Why? Because the end time work of Elijah is to restore Torah, worship, school of the prophets. Acts chapter 19, verse 6 in, in this Bible, it's only a page over. <clears throat> I'll make a liar out of these two pages over. <clears throat> Paul comes up on some guys. They didn't know what the Holy Spirit was. So he lays hands on them and prays. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. So here's just seven believers, just seven ordinary believers. Holy Spirit comes on, they prophesy. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit is supposed to open up prophecy and restore the school of the prophets. Now, it does take some schooling on how to use this effectively. Nonetheless, it was restored then and it needs restoring now. Acts 15, verse 32. <clears throat> Judas and Silence, who were themselves prophets. Prophets. The problem in modern America is people don't want to receive prophecy. Used to do it all the time, right? Prayer line after service. Go down the line. Pray for people. Tell you all kind of stuff I ain't supposed to know. I don't do it much anymore. Because people don't receive the prophecies. You go down the prayer line, you pray for them. It's the same thing that the Lord said last time we went down the prayer line. What's the deal? Third time, fourth time, fifth time. Okay, all right, no need to do this again. You already know. You already know. You just don't want to receive it. So I quit doing it. Well, what's the point? I mean, I'm hungry. I'm tired. I know this has to wear me out running down the prayer line if no one's going to receive the prayer and the prophecy and move on to the next thing. I just go eat. <laughs> well, you figure by the time I do that, it's a long day. I rolled out of my house at 7.50 this morning. Dressed for church and ready for bear. That's a long day when you get to the end and then and you pray over somebody and they're, oh, you just saying that. You already told me that. Well, yeah, I have. And now the Lord's telling you on top of it. You still ain't going to receive it. See what I'm saying? I mean, you got to receive the prophecies if you want to keep getting the prophecies. But isn't that the truth that we're talking about today? Because, you see, the Lord will reveal if you'll act on it. See, that's what makes Hungry Heart so special is when the Lord brings a revelation, we don't let it fall. We take it and we run with it. We do do our due diligence to study it out, but we're going to roll with it. We're going to study the revelations. We're going to dig. We're going to go. We're going to move. We're going to make something happen. Why? Well, that's where the benefit is. The benefit isn't in the temple talk. The benefit is the impl in the uh, implementation, and the benefit of the implementation is you're going to get another revelation. You can't go to the next one until you handle the first one. Ooh. You keep handling them, and you keep rolling with them. You keep getting more, and they keep getting better. They keep getting better, not less. Acts chapter 6, <clears throat> very interesting verse. One that you just tend to read over. Interesting verse. And one that... Even when you see it, you think about it, but it doesn't really catch traction in your head. You know what I'm saying? Verse 7. <clears throat> so the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Priests came in. A lot of priests came in. Wow. So we just read that over that. Oh, the priests came in. Okay. On to the next verse. Now, Stephen, a man full of grace and power. Let's think about this for a minute. Where did they go and what did they do? The men, these men who held the rituals of God, 
They held the rituals of God. They come into church. Did they bring some of that in? How would we know? We don't know because those records got burned. Is this why there's ceremony in the church? This is another revelation I got preaching this in Corinth this morning. <clears throat> From this record, which ends about 60 A.D., roughly, to the historians, I think Eusebius and Tertullian and some others, I don't remember all their names, in the second century, there's a gap. It's called the missing years. There's a gap. We have their word for it, and they're all in the Catholic Church. So that's tainted. And we have this, which is pure. So how to bridge this gap? Well, I'll give you an interesting one the Lord gave me during the message. Polycarp, we know a great man of God. Polycarp, a great man of God. It is attested by every writer of Polycarp that he stood firm opposing heresy. He stood firm opposing heresy. Even to the point he went to see Anacetus, Bishop of Rome, and opposed him to his face over Passover. You can't keep Passover on, on that pagan day of Ishtar. Passover's the 14th day of Nisan at evening. Goes all the way to Rome to do it. So this is all we really care about in the story, right? It's called the Quarto de Simeon controversy. Polycarp was our champion. Passover on the 14th day of Nisan. But we, we miss the last part of the story. Anicetus, not wanting to lose all the eastern churches, asked Polycarp to lead the ceremonies, which he did. There were ceremonies in the early church. We have a record of Polycarp leading them in Rome, no less. Did these priests bring in some a little ceremony? You know, look, I, I dedicated to World Wider. When the Lord first told me that he wanted some of that, I was like, I ain't that kind of girl. <laughs> I'm a World Wider. Our ceremony was no ceremony, right? You know, I... I um, read the Purpose Driven Church, and so I try to have people queued up, ready, so that when it's your turn to come do something, you're there. But no, 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 no. The appropriate worldwide approved way was you stayed in your seat till you were called on, and everybody waits while you walk all the way up there. And everybody has to have the appropriate gravity while this takes place. The person who is chosen for prayer has got to have his head down just right, and he's got to have the gravitas to go up here because we're going to pray to God. And everybody in the audience has got to, shh. Little kids, quiet, quiet. We're going to pray. Check. I'm not making this up. This is real deal stuff. Now we have you queued up, and we want to give you a rousing welcome, and we want to do it in an anointing. That ain't the way it was, because our ritual was no ritual. We made it a ritual, no ritual. And the Lord is saying, I want a little bit here. I want some priestly stuff. And I'm like, I ain't that kind of girl. Because that's what it felt like. And so me and the Lord went back and forth on this for a long time. And finally, he was getting exasperated with me. He said, Monopoly money. I'm like, Monopoly money? What does that have to do with anything? He goes, you were a bank teller. You had to learn the difference between counterfeit bills and real bills. That's back in 80, so they're a lot different now. No one thinks Monopoly money is counterfeit. You walk in the store with Monopoly money, nobody's taking you seriously. You're not taking yourself seriously because you know it's Monopoly money. For it to be counterfeit, it's got to look close enough to pass. So if that's the great counterfeit church, they have to do enough of it to pass. Okay. And I'm thinking, we're going to lose everybody in the church. And praise God, most of y'all stayed. So, well, I was really concerned about it. So why was there a ceremony in the early church? Is there something missing? Was there something genuine initially which was later corrupted? Well, we know it's corrupted later. The question is, was there something genuine first? First Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. So we know it got corrupted later. Was there something genuine from which it could be corrupted? 
Well, I think probably it was. And, you know, when you get into Hebrews, now look, I know some of y'all are old King James fans. But when you go to the book of Hebrews, that, that heading that says the epistle of Paul to the Hebrews, that's added. That ain't in the text. Somebody stuck that in there. Let me tell you something. Paul couldn't go in that temple. He didn't know nothing about what's going on in that temple. Paul's a Sadducee. He taught in the synagogues. As a matter of fact, when Paul went in to the court of men outside the gate, they took him to stone him. He wasn't even allowed in the court because he had been seen with Gentiles in the city. They were going to stone him. But the writer of Hebrews had been in the house. Now, who's a priest who was close to Paul? Barnabas. Barnabas was a priest. Paul was an eyewitness. The writer of Hebrews says, the word of the Lord was confirmed to us by those who saw him. Paul, Barnabas was not an eyewitness. Paul was. Paul was taught in Arabia three years by Jesus. So you got these little clues in there. Because see, the writer of Hebrews will tell you, he tell you how it is set up in the temple, and he goes, I can't tell you any more than that. That's all you can have. Why? Because you're not a priest. You're not allowed to know all that stuff. Paul didn't know it either because he wasn't allowed in there. Paul never offered incense at the altar. Paul never got to trim and refill the menorah. Paul never got to eat the showbread. But the writer of Hebrews obviously had done all of those things, and he knew how they were done, not just that they were done. Oh, come on. 1 Peter 2 and verse 4. <clears throat> As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans and, but chosen by God and precious, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. That should be better be rendered temple. You're being built into a spiritual temple. The church of God is a temple, and it is being built, to, and you are like a living stone built into this temple to be a holy priesthood offering sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Isn't that what we read in Malachi? We're being tested and purified so we can make acceptable offerings. That's what he said to me. It ain't an offering if you don't offer it. Verse 9. But we didn't know how to offer it. We don't have the rules for this. These people have been gone a long time. Verse 9. But you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood. A holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So you are a priesthood, a special chosen possession. What do priests do? They offer. They make offerings. We miss a lot of barbecue. But we can offer our prayers. We can offer our sermons. We can offer our funds. We can offer everything that we do as an offering even this service. Now, the worldwide church taught that elders served as priests and deacons as Levites. Is there more to that? Meaning, was there more to that? And this is the revelation that Mr. Armstrong could get from his time. Was it ministers serving as priests more than we know because so many of the priests came into the faith? And since they understood, then when men are so, and women are selected as deacons, these former priests are like, oh, no, son, it's a whole lot more waiting on tables, man. Let me show you what everything else you got to do. Why? Because they were in the temple. They knew the service of the Levites in the temple. They knew the service of the Levites. So they could say, well, it's not just, not just serving the food today, man. It's, come on, there's a whole bunch more stuff back here you got to do. So... Was there a whole system that these priests were able to bring into the early church, which gets lost to us today? But see, these things got to be restored. If Yeshua put this in the early church, these things have to be restored. They have to be now. Amen? <clears throat> so, we've done our best to make offerings acceptable while staying true to our worldwide roots, right? We don't want to be anything associated with the great false church. On the other hand, we want to use the appropriate things in Hebrew to make acceptable offerings. Amen? <clears throat> Is there more restoring to do in the way of offerings? I hope so. It's my earnest, fervent desire that we can offer everything we do, praise, prayer, funds, churches, missions, spirit, fire, etc., to the majesty on high in a way that befits his glory. 
and the more you understand the teaching, the non-Trinitarian teaching about the majesty and high who we call Avi or the Father, and Yeshua Messiah, who we call King of the Saints, the more we need to do things befitting the glory of the majesty on high because it's much bigger than we ever imagined. It's not like Yeshua better. It's like magnificent, and Yeshua is more magnificent as a result. Now, as my studies are showing, this is the starting point for a much, much bigger and more intense learning. For starters, is the concept of the storehouse. The storehouse. Yeshua first revealed this in 2018. Let's go to Isaiah 33. Now, I talked about it in, in uh, 2018 in terms of being ambassadors for Christ and how the host country, in our case, the kingdom of God, outfits the embassy. And for us to showcase the kingdom of God, which that is all correct, you know, your king is going to befit you as an ambassador to showcase his kingdom. And that's how I approach that message. But I think there's a lot more to the storehouse. Because you see, the priests had access to everything in that storehouse all the time. You go through and do a little study, and I didn't go real far. I mean, your, your first quick little skim the story is going to show you that oftentimes when treasures brought to the storehouse, the priest cataloged what went in, they detailed where it was going to be stored, and they were the ones to whom you requisitioned. They were the ones you requisitioned. All right. Now, <clears throat> verse 6. He will be the sure foundation for your times. Oh, my goodness. You couldn't have said that in a time more important than right now. A rich store of salvation, which is Yeshua, rich store of Yeshua, wisdom and knowledge. So there is a rich storehouse where you can access Yeshua. And there is a rich storehouse of wisdom. And I already related the story about the porch a bunch of times which that word wisdom in Hebrew means skill in anything. Skill in anything. No matter what you need skill in, you can pray in the Spirit, and if you know how to requisition, the Lord will give you the wisdom, the skill, to execute whatever it is you need to do at the time you need to do it. I don't know how much. That's pretty good. Now, knowledge here is deep learning on anything. So as I'm giving out speaking assignments for the feast, I'm telling everybody the same thing. Don't shortcut your feast assignment. Plan on 15 hours in the presence of Jesus. Plan on it. Not one time, not two times. One time, go dig in the Word a little bit. Take it back to Him. Go in, get some more revelation. Go back and dig in the Word. Do this. I'm talking about 12, 15 hours. See, people don't know how much time I put in these feast messages. At least I tell you, I put a lot of time in there. That don't count my digging, digging work. There's times if I wake up, I don't feel anointed, and I'm, I'm all discombobulated. Maybe I didn't sleep good or whatever. All right, I'm, I'm not much work used to today for creativity. I'm not very useful create, creatively. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the concordance out, and I'm just going to look up verses. I'm just going to look up words and verses. Today, today I ain't worth anything, so I'm just going to look up words and verses. You got them days too, right? Yeah, right. You got them days too. Just looking up the word. Because, see, at that point, I've already got the revelation. I already got the key words and thoughts. I've already done my first couple of things in the Bible. I've taken it back to Yeshua. What does that mean? I don't understand. Because the learning, the storehouse of learning. Next verse. The fear of the Lord is the key to the treasure. The fear of the Lord. I did that one time, except I messed up my mic. I did a mic drop one time, and the whole thing popped off. I could never make it stay on after that. So it's like, no, I like my mic. You remember the mic drop? Javon lost it, man. He and your dad lost it. Man, he passed it to the mic drop. <laughs> messed up my mic, though. So the, the key to this treasure is the fear of the Lord. The be, keeping Torah is the beginning of the fear of the Lord. Torah is the start of fearing the Lord. You fear him so you'll obey him. That's why it has to go into order. It went in. Torah, worship, 
School of the Prophets level operation in the Holy Spirit. So everything we need is in the storehouse. The deep mysteries of prophecy are still undiscovered. The work I did over the last two years opened up more things to study. It didn't really resolve anything. The more I studied, the more things need study. I wasn't unhappy, by the way. Yeah, that's what I thought. So I was doing a little research for something we're going to do in prayer. And I was looking up Babylon. One of the videos I watched on YouTube about Babylon, the guy goes into a storeroom, and he said, what's important about the storeroom? It's the most important thing ever discovered in the city of Babylon. There is <clears throat> these clay tablets that were receipts, right? Accounting, accounting ledgers, right? People don't like accounting. It's amazing stuff. So there's a ledger for King Jehoiakim of Judah, listed by name, coming to get his daily ration of olive oil. Oh, how's that? In the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, just like the Bible said. How's that? All right, we're going to go to Isaiah 47, and we're going to talk about the mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots. Isaiah 47. We're going to go just over, so just 75. Yeah. Oh, I got 15. I'm doing pretty good. <clears throat> Isaiah 47, verse 1. Go sit down in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Okay. So I'm studying all this prophecy. I can't make any sense out of any of it. So I go to the Encyclopedia Britannica. I'm reading all the stuff on Babylon. I'm like, ah, oh, none of this makes any sense. Then I come across this one little chance for word in the, you know, in, in the Encyclopedia Britannica. And it says that the original god of Babylon, I don't even remember the name, was a female deity who is a perpetual virgin. And she is the mother of all the other deities in the Babylonian pantheon, but she remains a perpetual virgin. And here God says in the opening verse, O virgin daughter of Babylon. See, I didn't know what that meant, but he already knew. He already knew. And nails it. But it's a clue telling you where to look for more information. So I'm watching all the stuff on the city of Babylon, and there's the Ishtar Gate. Okay. Her modern name, her Aramaic name is Ishtar. Ishtar Gate. It's this old virgin daughter of Babylon. Oh, yeah, it's all, it's all laid out there once you understand what you're looking at. All right, verse, verse 5. <clears throat> I don't like it there, so I'm going to look it up in here. Because this new version isn't very good. Let me find it. Okay, one more page. Now, Isaiah 47, verse 3 and 4. Now listen, you wanton creature lounging in your security and saying to yourself. See, it doesn't say that here. I am, and there's none beside me. I will never be a widow or suffer the loss of children. Both of these are going to take you in a single day, and they're going to come upon you in full measure in spite of your many sorceries and your potent spells. In her heart she boasts, I sit as a queen. I'm not a widow. I will never mourn. So it kind of messes it up here. In verse 5, it says, 6, I was angry with my people. I desecrated my inheritance. I gave them in your hand, and you showed them no mercy. Even on the ages, you laid a very heavy yoke. You said, I am forever the eternal queen. But you didn't consider. And then in verse, I, I picked it up in verse 8. Dear, it doesn't say, then now, then listen, you lover of pleasure. It's you wanton creature. Well, she's a Barbie doll. She doesn't have that. So wanton means exactly what you think it means. And I had to look that up. Because, you see, this particular creature enjoys watching you destroy yourself with Toeva Acts. She enjoys watching you commit Toeva sexual acts and destroy yourself. She gets a thrill out of that. 
But understanding who this is opened up a whole new vista of prophecy that was heretofore undiscovered. Not coincidentally, this is what's in front of your face in 2023, right now in America, with wanton sexual acts all over the place and people glorifying in it and people rubbing your nose in it and demanding you agree with it. So Yeshua is using Hungry Hearts Ministries to be a part of restoring all things, even including this prophetic stuff. <clears throat> By the way, $12, you can get it. Well, you can't get it online, but if you mail me... $12, I'll send you this. It's uh, What Comes Next, great workbook. It's going to be radically expanded in the next 18 months. But that's what we have for now. You can, you can mail me at uh, Post Office Box 10334, Jackson, Tennessee, 38308. So we're a part of restoring all things. He's, Yeshua is using us, and I am very grateful to be a part of that. And I am very sincere in longing for you to be a part of it. There's still a lot of work to be done. Someone's going to do it. The thing about Yeshua his work is going to get done. The only question is whether you're going to be a part of it or whether someone else is going to do your work. What does he tell you in one of the letters to the churches? Let no one take your crown. Why? It's not that someone's going to run up to you and beat you up and take it off your head. I think that's in the letter to Philadelphia, by the way. You're going to walk away from your assignment and someone else is going to execute your assignment. Don't anybody take your crown. Execute your assignment, amen, or assignments. But you know, if you don't do your first assignment, you can't have a second. Every time you skip an assignment, you go back to the beginning. You don't go forward, you go back. That's why you got to keep them as you go along. So after leading the Sabbath world for so long, after being out front, after doing things first, from praise and worship to spirit-filled to ordaining women to the prophetic understanding to making offerings and reestablishing a priesthood in the ministry, why would we want to relinquish our lead? You know, <clears throat> it's been on my mind a lot the last couple of months, the movie, The Field of Dreams, because the Lord gave us that word at the very beginning of the ministry, you need to watch The Field of Dreams. And they built it, and nobody came, right? Well, the ball players came, but the crowds didn't come, and he couldn't support it, even though he's watching all this great ball. Then he said, feel their pain. Man, I felt enough pain to float the earth. Then he said, go the distance. And if you remember in the movie, they're sitting up in the stand saying, I'm going to close it. They're, I'm being foreclosed. The whole thing is over. I've lost everything I own. And then you see the people start coming, right? Miles and miles of cars coming down that old dirt road. Would it not be horrible for the miles and miles of people to come down the dirt road right after you left? Because if you remember, people left right before they came up. Don't, don't be those people. Hang in there for the finish. I say we go forward. Yeshua is with us. We have a unique understanding in the word, and we have standing from our previous victories to open up fresh revelations and keen understanding to solve deep and deeper mysteries. Mr. Armstrong wrote a book called Mystery of the Ages, yet it's been given to us to reveal the mysteries which he could only dream of understanding. I say forget the grumbling full speed ahead. Pastor Bill Schultz, I hope that you enjoyed this message. I hope it encourages you to have a closer walk with Jesus and helps you to get stronger in the Word of God. If you're interested in more information about Hungry Hearts Ministries, you can go to either one of our websites, Hungry Hearts Ministry with a Y.com or HungryHeartsChurch.com for more information. We have many free materials available, including our magazine, Pursuit. If you will email me at HungryHeartsMIN at AOL.com, I will mail this to you every quarter. The only thing that we're ever going to use your uh, mailing address for is to send you this magazine or maybe invite you to a meeting. Hope you enjoyed this message, and we look forward to seeing you again next week.